corporate finance practice problem using OneNote. Coefficient of variation and investment risk. Get ready, it's time to take your chance with corporate finance. Here we are in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along. You're not required to, but if would like to, we're on the icon left-hand side in the Practice Problems tab, then down in the 1318 Coefficient of Variation and Investment Risk tab. Also note, when using OneNote, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool. Our presentations up top will be mirrored down in the text area. Same name, same number, but with transcripts, transcripts that can be translated and either listened to or read in multiple different languages closing the icon up we have our information up top we're going to go through the calculations on the right in the blue area focusing in on the coefficient of variation now when we think about different types of investments and different types of opportunities that we might be comparing the coefficient of, of variation is typically what we're going to be using to think about the level of risk so we talked about how to get to some of these components which are the expected return and the standard deviation in prior presentations. We're gonna say that they are given at this point so that we can compare multiple different uh, scenarios. If you have questions then about how to get to the expected return, what is the expected return and so on, and the standard deviation and so on, take a look at the prior presentations. We're gonna have those given so that we'll calculate the coefficient of variation. Use that to think about the level of risk between different types of investment options. So the coefficient variation would then be calculated. Once we have these two numbers quite easily calculated, we'll just divide them out. We're going to take then the standard deviation, the 1300 divided by the 1700. That would give us, if we round here, 0.765. You might see it represented as a percent or a decimal. And then we're going to take the 7,000 divided by the 31000. That's going to give us the 0.226 about. Then we have the 9,000, 9,000 divided by the 31,000. And that's going to give us the 0.290. Then we're going to be picking up the 50,000. The uh, no, I'm sorry, 23,000 divided by the 50,000. That's going to give us the 0.460. And then finally, finally, 88,000 divided by the 176,000 gives us the 0.5. Now then the next step, which is probably the, the one to be focused in on more with a problem like this, is to rank these from level of risk. So if we were to rank these, this one here, I'm just going to remove this. This one would be the lowest number. So the lower the number, typically the less amount of the risk because we have the less kind of variation from the center point or the average or the expected return so this would be one uh the second then then three uh this number three over here would be two is with regard to risk this one would be three with regard to risk four with regard to risk and five with regard to risk just going from lowest to highest now then if you think about that further just notice that the expected returns are quite different this is kind of what we would expect the return to be based on you know our calculations that and if you want to go more into that you can look at prior presentations but that's what we kind of expect the return to be kind of like the average return or the mean obviously the fifth one here is much higher so if we were going by expected return then we would think number five we would pick then number five number four and then these two are the same and then number one last so if I didn't have anything on the coefficient of variation, I wasn't looking at risk at all, and I was simply looking at return, then of course this one would be the best, this one, and then these two are the same, and then the, this one up top, the 176,000, in other words, the then the 50,000, then there's two for 31,000, and one for 17,000 would then be last. If I look at just the ranking with regards to return, then the, this one at the 0.226, which is actually the 31,000 would be the lowest, with return and the best in that case for for less level of uh, risk and then the two then the two point uh the two nine zero would be number two number three the the fifty thousand for the point four six zero and then number four the one seventy six thousand now if you consider both of those obviously if the if the risk is going up we would only consider picking that one if the expected return was also going up so if I look at this one, for example, that has the least amount of risk, it's at the 31,000. The second one here that has the second amount of risk, a higher amount of risk, has the same expected return. So between those two, you would think that we would pick the first one because it has the same expected return and a lower amount of risk. 
So why take on, in other words, a higher amount of risk when the expected return is the same would be kind of the, the general idea, would be the general notion. So between those two, you would think you pick the first one. And then if you go from here to number three, we get, now we got a 50,000 return and the increased risk. So now the question, of course, would be, well, the expected return going from 31,000 to 50,000, then is it worthwhile for us to, to have that higher expected return given the fact that the risk is also going up, right? And then if I go from three to uh, four, this one has a, has a substantial difference in the expected return, but also in, 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 and a difference in the risk assessment. So once again, the question is, well, now the expected return is quite a bit higher here. Is that worthwhile to take on the added level of risk? And then number five up top is actually the most risky. So this one, the, why would you pick this one at all is the question. You probably wouldn't pick number five because it has the lowest expected amount of return and also is the most risky. And remember, that could happen. So I, it doesn't, whenever you think about stocks, you're always thinking, you're always hearing people or any type of investment. You got to you got to spend money to make money. You got to take on a risk. You know, the reward comes with risk and there's truth to that. But don't don't let that lead you to believe that simply a higher increase in risk means that there's a higher expected return. The higher increase in risk, you know, you can have risk go up to the moon and not have a, a higher expected return. Right. It just you know, so you want to make sure that if you are taking on higher risk, you're doing so with the idea that the expected return is going up too. That's why you're willing to take on the higher risk. If the higher risk is going up and the expected return is not going up, then that's what you want to weed out. You don't want to, that's not, that's not where you want to be. Then that's going to be the objective. So the, it is true that typically that the chances for higher expected returns typically will have higher risk related to them. So you want, and the question, once you weed those out is to pick those, those out, but it is possible to see higher risk go up quite possible clearly to have risk go up without having the expected returns go up and those are the ones that you kind of want to weed out and then come to the decision as to whether the expected return being higher is worth the, the added level of risk when you're comparing multiple different investment opportunities.